Why should Henry have a new shape, he grumbled. A shape good enough for me is good enough for him. He goes gallivanting off to crew, leaving us to do his work, and comes back saying how happy he feels. It's disgraceful. Well, this was going to happen one way or another. Someone just had to upset the balance around here. You know, just because the design you have works doesn't mean it's the best for everyone else. You still have the title of the fastest engine on Sodor, so why should you even care? I think someone is feeling envious. In which case Gordon was. Not only was Henry taking the Express more frequently now, but he couldn't help but point out how much better he felt. He did this by whistling whenever he arrived at a station. Something Gordon found to be unnecessary. It isn't wrong, but we just don't do it. Poor Henry didn't feel happy anymore. Never mind, whispered Percy. I'm glad you're home again. I like your whistling. Oh, that was thoughtful of you, Percy. Even Mr. Cheekyhead himself knows when to be polite. But really, though, if Henry has to be admonished for not being able to pull trains while feeling sick, or being able to pull trains while he's in the fittest shape of his life, then what can he do? There's like no winning here. Gordon needs to cut him a break already, at least on that end of things. Later that day, Henry stopped at Edward's station. Edward, of course, being the kind engine that he was, told Henry not to worry about Gordon's comments because he too thought Henry was fine for sounding his whistle. Hello, Henry, said Edward. You look splendid. I was pleased to hear your happy whistle yesterday. Thank you, Edward, smiled Henry. Then some high-pitched tone could be heard in the distance. Turned out it was Gordon flying down the line with his whistle on full blast at a constant rate. Finding the predicament hilarious, Edward and Henry couldn't help but laugh. When Gordon reached Knapford Station, Top Hat demanded someone stop Gordon's faulty whistle. What I find funny is that it looks like those swings were just taps. Not even hard knocks. I also bet that hammer is the size of someone's finger in real life. It looks so tiny, as much as that's supposed to be to scale. It isn't wrong, murmured Henry to no one in particular, but we just don't do it. No one mentioned whistles. The next day, Henry was taking another train, and this time passed underneath a bridge with children on it. But these were not ordinary children. No, they were vandals. As Henry went by, the kids threw stones and shattered the coach's windows. Everyone, from the passengers to the coaches themselves, were shocked in disbelief. What is the deal here? Rain? Coal? Frozen points? Gordon? And now misbehaving children are all causing issues for Henry. I understand that between these stories have been a spacious amount of time, but it really feels like one thing right after the other. This time, though, Henry had decided to take matter into his own hands. Buffers. Whatever. What will you do, they asked. Can you keep a secret? Yes, yes. Well then, said the driver, Henry is going to sneeze at those boys. Now although that may seem a bit useless in concept, Henry's operators had a plan on how they were going to do it. The next time they came around, they made sure Henry had plenty of ashes, which made him quite stuffed up, as it is vividly shown here with Henry's wrinkled nose. When they got closer, his driver had told him when to sneeze. This worked successfully in confusing the heck out of the kids, and Henry felt fairly happy with himself. Although I do question the whole idea of telling when someone should sneeze. Everyone knows you can't exactly control a sneeze. When you have to sneeze naturally, it comes at random. You can't really prepare to sneeze on your own time. No matter, though. Henry went home very pleased with himself. He had taught Gordon and silly boys a lesson with a whistle and a sneeze. Henry seems to be kicking some real tender as of late. As much as things have been going awry for him, it's unbelievable how many things are against him, and yet he still comes out on top. That's a good thing because it means Henry is learning not to try and let things bother him so much, and instead of sulking about it, finding a way to fix it. It's also good to know that others on the island support Henry like Percy and Edward. It also shows that someone's listening and feels something needs to be said. For Gordon, I get where his jealousy and complaining comes from, but it's all done so he can feel better about himself. And like in the end, Gordon just ends up getting caught doing the exact thing he condemns. He'll learn one way or another, I guess. As for those dastardly little children, someone ought to whoop them into shape. This is actually the first time we've seen humans on the island act badly. The only other person that acted wrongly was the bootlace man from James and the Coaches. But he didn't destroy company property. The music and visuals aren't too variant right now, though. For music, all we hear are Gordon and Henry's themes, which are welcome nonetheless. And we have for the most part seen almost everything right now that's been shown before. The difference in this episode is that Gordon and Henry take the regularly traveled paths in opposite directions. 
Oh, and we finally see all six engines together at Tismuth Sheds for once. That's not been done yet. That's it for this, though. Next episode is Toby and the Stout Gentleman. Thanks for watching. Thank you.